How long will you run? Before you realize... He's faster. Well, hi everyone, no matter where you're joining us from today, thank you so much for being with us. I pray that God would speak to you in these next moments. Well, if you're a fisherman or the friend of a fisherman, uh, you've probably heard the, of a practice called catch and release, which means that when, when you capture the fish on your line, you unhook them and throw them back in the water unharmed. Now, ironically, the Old Testament includes a catch and release story of its own, except it's the fish who catches the person and then releases the person back into the wild. It's the story of Jonah. And actually, it, was, it wasn't the fish. It was clearly God who caught his runaway prophet and also God who miraculously released him to fulfill his purpose and a very difficult assignment. Now, you may think of Jonah as a children's story, but his life provides many grown-up lessons especially to those of you who may find yourself running from God or running from your calling or running from a difficult assignment. I think we can all learn from Jonah an important two-word lesson when it comes to our relationship with God. Stop running. <laughs> That's the title of our series through the book of Jonah this month, and I think we're going to learn many, many lessons along the way about running and redemption. And so I'm very excited to kick us off today. This is also the first of a number of sermon series that we're going to do through this year called 10th Anniversary Favorites. I've been a pastor at Grace for 25 years, but I've been the lead pastor for 10 of those. And our team thought it would be cool for me to look back at some of my favorite series that I think are still incredibly relevant and pull them out and dust them off and breathe some new life into them. And so I preached a Jonah series back in 2012, and I think you'll find that the principles and lessons are incredibly timeless in November of 2020. Now, the question is, why would we want to study Jonah, this cautionary tale uh, from the Old Testament? Well, I think there are three compelling reasons that, that we want to look at this this month. The first is this. It's to be reminded that God pursues sinners. The story of Jonah provides us a concrete example of sin and grace, and I think that's very good for us to see. Jonah's sin comes in the, in the form of running away from God. And I'm not sure that even by the end of the story, Jonah really gets it, but regardless, we see this clear and concrete example of God's grace, a sovereign and merciful father, despite Jonah's sin. God pursues sinners, remember, and no matter who you are, where you're from, or what you've done, God loves you and is pursuing you with his grace. The second reason to study Jonah is to remember the greatness of God. So, so let me do a little word association with you, especially if you grew up in church. So when I say the word Jonah, what do you think? It's probably the word whale. But here's the thing. The book of Jonah is, is a total of 48 verses. Do you know how many of those verses talk about a whale? Three. The, the whale is not the author's main concern here. This is not a story about a big fish. It's a story about a big God. Because compared to hurricanes and tempests and angry oceans, God is greater. And compared to whales and creatures of the sea, God is greater. Compared to Nineveh, the great and evil hub of the ancient world, God is greater still. And so we want to remember God's greatness. Here's the third reason to study Jonah. It's to see God's love for a city. So when God loves a city, we're reminded in this book that we must love our city too. And even if there's fear, even if there's prejudice, as there was with Jonah, God calls us to push through all that because even if a city doesn't care about God and the people don't want him, he wants them and he loves them, and he wants to send his church into the midst of that city, as he has us, so that the city can be loved and hear about the love of God and the saving grace of Jesus. And so through our study, Jonah will remind us that God pursues sinners, that God is greater than anything that we'll ever face, and that God loves even wayward cities. And I'm excited to study this with you. Now, this book is one of the best known, but one of the most debated books of the Bible. Much of the debate revolves around the idea of, did this really happen? Like, it's hard for our, our modern brains to believe that a guy lived for three days in the belly of a whale. I mean, there are all kind of questions that go with that. But here's what I would say to that. Honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'd even put this in my top 20 hardest things to believe about the Bible. 
Genesis 1, God spoke the worlds into existence with a word of his mouth. Luke 2 says God was born as a baby who heals the sick and raises the dead and is crucified and rises again. I mean, it's like, why would you pick out the whale part and say, this is impossible? If God created all the galaxies with a word, he can pull off stuff like this. And other people have said, well, you know, this is just a parable. And, and, and that is possible. But the problem is that it's not written that way. Like it has names and dates and details. It's written like it's history. And so we'll read in just a moment. Verse 1 of Jonah starts out. It says, Jonah, the son of Amittai. It doesn't say, once upon a time there was a man named Jonah. No, the author is giving us historical facts and figures in real time and space. But the kicker for me is when I see in the New Testament that Jesus himself believed that this book was a historical report, that this actually happened. And so I just go, okay, well, here's a good rule of thumb. When in doubt, go with Jesus. All right, so let's kick this thing off. As you're finding your way to Jonah chapter one in the Old Testament in your Bible or device, here's my big idea today. You can run from God, but you can't outrun God. Did you hear that, all you runners? Those of you who, who, who tend to come up on a challenge or come up on a commitment and you're like, I'm out of here, right? This one's for you. If Jonah was here today, I think he'd offer us some advice and, and we're gonna just call them four lessons from a runner today, okay? Here's the first. It's that God will ask you to do things that you don't wanna do. Look at Jonah chapter one and verse one. It says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now, notice that phrase. It says, the word of the Lord came. So this is a technical phrase unique to the function of a prophet. A prophet's job was to speak the word of the Lord. And so when this phrase is used, it means the prophet got his marching orders. And so Jonah is about to say no to this request. And so, and so this is a big deal. Because in this relationship, God is the boss and, and the prophet here is the employee. And so when the word of the Lord came, these weren't optional, these weren't negotiable. The whole job of an Old Testament prophet was simply to say the words God told them to say. And so when Jonah looks back at his boss and he says, no, I'm not gonna say that, this is not just an isolated incident of disobedience, it's a resignation. It's equivalent of Jonah saying, I quit. And so we have to ask, well, why was Jonah so distraught about this assignment that he was quitting his job as a prophet of God? What happened? Well, he heard three other words that made him want to hang up his cleats. The three words are right there in verse 2. He says, go to Nineveh. You see, Jonah was God's spokesman, but he, was, he only spoke to Israel. He only spoke to God's chosen people. And so he had nothing to do with foreign cities. And this, one, this foreign city was about 550 miles northeast of where Jonah was in Jerusalem. So, so in our terms, imagine the distance from Erie, PA, to Bangor, Maine. And this wasn't just any foreign city. It was Nineveh. And Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And you see there in verse 2 that Nineveh is called the great city. And there are a couple of ways that it would have been considered great. First, it was great in size. It was huge for that day. It was 60 miles in circumference, maybe 2 million people. Uh, the walls around Nineveh were 100 feet high. They were wide enough on top that three chariots could race side by side around the wall. There, there were 1,500 towers in the wall, each of them 200 feet high. So the city was huge. But it wasn't just the size that made Nineveh great. It was the sheer power. You see, Assyria was the most powerful nation in the world, and they used that power to be brutal and menacing to other people from other nations. They practiced genocide as state policy. The, the biblical book of Nahum refers to Nineveh as the city of blood. They were known for their unspeakable cruelty. They would skin their enemies alive, and they would bury them up to their heads so that they would just languish in pain. Just awful. There are even accounts that to complete the torture, they would make their prisoners listen to Justin Bieber music all night long. <laughs> no, I made that part up. That's not in the historical records. Anyway, <laughs> the word of God comes to Jonah saying, go to Nineveh and preach. Now, note, notice what it says next in verse 2. He, sa he says, doesn't say, go to Nineveh and call out to it. It says, go to Nineveh and call out against it. How terrifying. So here's the assignment. Hey, Jonah, I want you to learn to speak Assyrian, and then I want you to go and tell these horrible and abusive people 
to their faces that God is going to judge them. Now, I know Jonah kind of gets a bad rap for running away, but you can see why he says, you know, hey God, you know, can we come up with an alternate plan here or I quit? I would ask you today, has God ever asked you to do something hard? Like, I want you to forgive that person. Or I want you to share your faith with that person. Or I want you to give your last paycheck to that cause. What about something that seemed impossible? How about something that made you want to run in the complete opposite direction? Nineveh was way out of Jonah's comfort zone. Nineveh is the place God calls you to where you don't want to go. Nineveh is trouble. Nineveh is danger. Nineveh is fear. So what do you do when God says to you, go to Nineveh? Go to that place where you don't want to go. Because I've found that sometimes God will say that to you. God will ask you to do things that you don't want to do. It's part of the deal. So God gives this very clear but uncomfortable assignment to Jonah. Go to Nineveh, that evil place, and call them to repentance. Now, look at the first word of verse 3. The word is but. It's an important word. We're going to see later in the story when Jonah actually listens, the word of the Lord will come to him again as a second chance. And that time the Bible says, so Jonah. But for now, it's but Jonah. When he got the assignment, it says, but Jonah. Look at verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He found a ship going to Tarshish. And so he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Here's the second lesson I want you to see. Sin is saying no to God. Look at verse 3. It says, Jonah started to run from God. Remember, this was a godly man. In fact, Jonah was like clergy. He was like the pastor or priest or missionary of his day, which reminds us that even godly people sin. In fact, you're never farther away from God than when you're close to God and say no. And so as this story develops, we're going to see that there are plenty of people who are far from God. There's a whole city of Nineveh that is just evil. There's a boat full of pagan sailors that we'll meet in a moment. And here we have a preacher. And they're all equally far from God. But Jonah was the only one who had no excuse. He knew God. And he was knowingly running from God. And listen, he he was seriously running. Because most people don't know their ancient geography very well. And and they they don't know how committed Jonah was to running. He literally went in the complete opposite direction. And so just again, to put it in terms we understand, if God called Jonah to go from Erie, Pennsylvania to Bangor, Maine, 550 miles to the Northeast, it would have been like him instead getting on a train to Colorado Springs, 1,500 miles to the Southwest. He was going the complete wrong way. He wanted no part of Nineveh. And so he goes to Joppa, he buys a ticket for a boat to Tarshish, 1,500 miles in the wrong direction. Now, this brings up an important theological question. How do you run away from someone who's omnipresent? And the short answer is, you don't. But but let's spend a minute pondering this. Later in verse 9, we find out that Jonah acknowledges that he, he knows that God is everywhere, which means he's not running from God geographically. You can't do that if God is all present. No, he's running from God relationally. We do it all the time. So so I don't know if you saw in in verse 3 there, it says that he was running away from the presence of the Lord. And this gets at the heart of our sin. It's not the places we run to that frame our sin. Sin starts with our desire to remove ourselves from God's presence. Sin is simply saying, God, you're not enough for me. Like, I like my job better. I like thrills better. I like this relationship better. I like substances better. Because you don't seem to be enough for me. And so when you ask me to come close, when you ask me to to come after you, my response, God, is no. You see, a simple definition of sin is just saying no to God. It's what Jonah did here. But what's surprising is not that Jonah ran. Because with the description of Nineveh that I just shared, most of us would have run too. But we probably would have run for different reasons. Fear for our lives, safety, probably the two leading contenders. But why did Jonah run? Well, I'm going to skip ahead in just a minute. I'm going to ruin the ending of the book for you, sorry. But I think it's important for us to have our minds uh, set on this as we consider why Jonah was a runner. Remember, Jonah was a professional clergyman. He had seen God do miraculous things. He knew all that God was capable of. 
And eventually Jonah does make it to Nineveh. But beyond that, his mission is actually successful. The people from this horrible city repent and they turn to God. And, and Jonah lives to tell about it. He should be doing cartwheels. This miraculous tent revival worked. But instead, he gets angry. And he reveals to us why he ran from this assignment in the first place. And so in chapter 4, verse 2, Jonah says this to God. He says, That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Here's what he just said. He just said, God, I didn't want to go because I knew that you would have mercy on those people. And I didn't want them to get off that easy. Jonah said, the reason I ran in the first place, the reason I got into that boat to go to Tarshish is because I'm a self-righteous, racist bigot. And I wanted those people to burn in hell like they deserve. What? This is a man of God. And so the next logical question is, why in the world would God ask Jonah, a man that he knew hated these people so much, who he knew was a self-righteous bigot, to go and proclaim the love of God to them? Why would God do that? Here's what I think. I think God asked Jonah to do this because he knew how Jonah's heart would respond. He knew Jonah's sin would be revealed, front and center. And what God wanted Jonah to see is that although he acted religious, although he looked religious on the outside, though he did religious things, that his heart had not yet been fully transformed by God's grace like it should be. He's revealing Jonah's sin to him. We talked in August about love over fear and the idea that we often let assumptions creep in and create monsters out of people. Like if someone believes something different than me, they're the other, they're a monster, and they need to be either canceled or avoided at all costs. And God comes and gives us an assignment that will reveal our sin. You see, there's no better way to identify what sin is and, 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 and where it is in our life than to look at where we're saying no to God. It's his way of revealing our idols to us. God says, remain sexually pure. But you say, no, 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 I'm going to fool around anyway. Or God says, love your enemy, even those who vote differently than you. But you say, no, no, I'm going to keep them on blast at all times. God says, forgive those who have harmed you. And you say, no, I'm going to keep on nursing this grudge. Thank you very much. You want to track down your idols? You want to track down your sin? Go find those places where you're saying no to God. So Jonah runs to find a ship to Tarshish a train to Colorado Springs, because he knows that he doesn't want to be in Bangor, Maine with the Ninevites. But he knows that he can't stay in Erie either because God is going to keep hounding him. And so let me tell you, when you're running from God, there will always be a ship to Tarshish waiting to and available to, to help you run. There will always be a ship ready to sail you away. Listen, from hard to happy, did you ever notice that people often assume that, that the readiness of the ship is equivalent to God's will? When, when in fact, it could just be the enemy trying to assist you out of God's difficult calling for your life. And so you're like, listen, I've been sober for two years, but I went to my pantry and I found a bottle of booze there that I had hid from three years ago. It must be a sign from God saying that it's okay for me to start drinking casually again. Or you're in the midst of an affair and you say, well, I was miserable in my marriage and then God dropped this person into my life because he wants me to be happy. Let me tell you something. If you want to run from God, there will always be a ship ready to take you from what seems hard to what seems happy. But remember, you have an enemy whose whole job it is to ready the ship so that you can run from God's best for you. And if you allow your eyes to wander, there will almost always be a girl who will return your fl flirtations. If you want out of your marriage, there will always be a too-good-to-be-true relationship that presents itself to you. If you want to tolerate greed in your life, there will always be a way to cheat or steal or get ahead. But what you're doing is you're saying no to God, and that is sin. So Jonah gets on a ship to Tarshish. He thinks he's running towards safety and opportunity and security. Maybe you do too. But often what looks safe from a human perspective is not actually safe at all. I know this, that you're only truly safe 
when you're doing what God told you to do in the first place. Look at verse four. It says, but the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. And then the, the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and he had lain down and was fast asleep. So, so God has been reasonably passive with Jonah's antics up until now. But now the God of the universe decides to get involved. He, he's not going to be brushed aside or ignored. And so he flexes a little muscle here. And God in his great mercy, listen, God in his great mercy sends one heck of a storm. Did you hear there in verse 4? It says like an angry girlfriend that the ship threatened to break up. <laughs> We can see how intense this storm is by the reaction of the sailors. First, we learn in verse 5 that they were afraid. These guys don't get afraid. They've seen just about everything, but they're panicked. You probably also notice that they found religion. They, they start throwing up prayers to anyone they can think of. They grab some crystals. They're like, I heard crystals work or some naked Buddhas or whatever. And they dig out the prayer rugs and the miracle hankies from the TV evangelist. And they just start all the foxhole prayers. God save us, God save us. And to Jonah's shame, these pagan sailors are up on top trying to have a spiritual conversation. And the man of God with the message of God is asleep on the job down below. And so they're jettisoning the cargo. And again, this is a desperate move. It shows how serious the storm is that God has kicked up here. Some of these guys would have worked their whole lives to make this trip and to take this cargo to sell. And now their hopes and dreams and life savings are going overboard into the sea. This is a desperate situation. And it seems like everyone knows it but Jonah. Now I think we're supposed to take notice of the downward spiral of sin, which starts with a minor disobedience and it ends in disaster. Like a porn addiction at 20 turns into an adulterous relationship at 40. Like jealousy issues in junior high turn into an eating disorder in grad school. Or, or unkind words then turn into a broken marriage now. Or a little greed then turns into a financial disaster now. Sin always leads in kind of this downward spiral. And some of you are in the downward spiral of sin right now. Like somewhere along the line you've said no to God. And if he hasn't already, God at some point will probably send a storm into your life to get your attention and to break you free from your self-reliance and to call for your obedience to his plan once again. And here we see our third lesson from a runner. It's when you run from God, people around you will get hurt. Look at verse 6. It says, so the captain came and said to him, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give you give a thought to us that, that we may not perish. And they, they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know who, on whose account this evil has come upon us. And so they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. Like, what is your occupation and where do you come from? What, what is your country and of what people are you? Listen, guys, if you're running from God, people around you are gonna to start to get hurt. Some of you, people around you are dying because you're not walking with God. Dads, dads, your refusal to walk with God has eternal consequences for your wife and kids. Young people, if you're running from God, people all around you will start to get caught in your blast zone of your wandering. Like it's why you hurt the people closest to you even if you don't mean to. See, when we run from God, we, we have this blast zone around us that'll start hurting others. It's like, remember, you know, Pig Pen from Charlie Brown? Remember that dude? He, he walked around with that cloud of dirt kind of always encircling him. Some of you look like that when you're running. Like if people get sucked into your orbit, they're gonna come out damaged. And even if it's not you that's running from God, but you're spending a lot of time with someone who is, your life will eventually be affected. Listen, teenagers, do you know why your parents look at your friend group sometimes and go, uh, no, I don't think so? Or, or ladies, do you know, know why your friends look at your latest boyfriend and say, girl, no? They see something that you don't. They know this principle that if you run with people who are far from God for long enough, at some point, listen, their storms are gonna become your storms. You're gonna get sucked in like a tornado. 
And so the, the sailors cast lots and Jonah loses and they start grilling Jonah with questions. What's your job? Where are you from? Favorite color, shoe size, brand of underwear. It gets pretty personal. And so finally, Jonah decides to come clean. He cuts to the heart of the matter. And verse 9 is one of the two core confessions of the whole book of Jonah. Look at chapter 1, verse 9. It says, And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who has made the sea and dry land. This is a very good first step. He makes a public declaration of his faith in God. And as Jonah begins making better decisions, things start to improve for everyone. Jonah finally understood that, that, that God was up to something. And he realized what I hope some of you will realize, that it's time to stop running. Look at verse 12. It says, And he said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea, and then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. So for the first time, Jonah says, I'm not going to run from God anymore. God, whatever it takes, whatever the cost is, I will not run from you anymore. And so he says, guys, throw me in. And guess what? The sailors don't do it. They don't want to kill a dude. They don't want blood on their hands. Instead, verse 13 says that the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. So here, these guys' lives are at stake, but they don't want to sacrifice the life of this Hebrew stranger. Listen, this foreigner. Remember, Jonah is running because he doesn't want God to show mercy to a bunch of foreigners, and now he's the foreigner, and these pagan sailors are fighting for his life. They they have more compassion, more raw humanity on Jonah than Jonah himself had on the people of Nineveh that God assigned him to go reach. But he tells them, guys, the wrath is for me. The wrath is for me and not for you, and so throw me in, and you'll be saved. What's he doing? He's just doing the next right thing. The, the only way the storm will, will drown him is if he continues to run from God. But if he turns and just says, God, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to do the next right thing. I'm going to surrender to you. It's then that he's saved. Remember, you can run from God, but you can't outrun God. Look at verse 14. It says, therefore, they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life. And lay not on us innocent blood for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. And so they picked up Jonah, they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. So they take him to the side of the boat. Now, just imagine this moment. Awesome storm, terrified sailors, runaway prophet, boat taking on water. Don't you wonder what's going on in Jonah's mind? Like, he's going to die. He knows he's going to die. But he's tired of running. His body is thrown into the water. And on top of the deck, for all of the sailors, all of the sudden, everything is calm. Like that, the storm is gone. See, sometimes you're running so hard and the storm keeps going until you finally say, all right, God, I'll stop running. My life, my behavior, my relationships, my time, my money, my attitude, it's all yours. God, I'm done running. And listen, when you get there, you feel like you're going to die. But then the storm calms down. And it's your surrender that God was after all along. Look at verse 16. 16 says, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows. And I love this verse. I want to make sure you all catch this. Because up above on the deck, God turned this pagan ship into a good old-fashioned church service. Like it became a floating house of worship. And I want you to see this, that even when you're running from God, He can still use you. Like even when you're running away from God, even when you're disobeying him, doing exactly the opposite of what he called you to do, God is still in control. Even in Jonah's running, he saved these sailors. Now look at verse 17. It's our final lesson today from this runner named Jonah. And it's just this, that sometimes God will send a storm to save you. It says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. See, we usually see storms as destroying us, but sometimes God sends storms to save us. He begins to order our circumstances and experiences to draw us back to himself. God's the one that blew up the wind. God is the one who let the lots fall to Jonah. God is the one who made the sea grow more tempestuous as Jonah continued to run. And God is the one who stopped the storm in an instant when Jonah went overboard. God is sovereign. 
And we notice in verse 17 who it is that sent the fish to ultimately rescue Jonah. God did that too. It says, notice, the Lord appointed the fish. And so when we say no and we decide to run, God isn't sitting on his hands, but he's not wringing his hands either. God didn't lose track of Jonah in the storm. In fact, he sent the storm to save Jonah. And some of you are in the middle of a storm right now and you think it's for your destruction, when in fact, it's for your salvation. If only you will stop running. We'll, we'll much, much more on that next week. But for today, our four lessons from the runner are this, that first, God will ask you to do things that you don't wanna do. Second, sin is saying no to God. Third, when you run from God, people around you will get hurt. And four, sometimes God will send a storm to save you. I'm really excited to walk through this series with you this month. You can find a great reading plan to help your daily walk with God that, that goes along with this series over at whoisgrace.com slash read. People say all the time, well, I'd read the Bible, but I just don't know where to start. This takes all the guesswork out of it for you. You can follow right along there. But beyond that, let me challenge you with a couple of next steps. First, will you commit to this series? You know, deciding to come to church doesn't happen on Sunday morning. It happens during the week leading up to it when all the other options present themselves. So will you just commit up front? Will you just say, I'm, I'm gonna make this a priority in my schedule for this month? And guys, there are so many different ways that you can join us each weekend through the month of November. Pick one and commit to it. Here's the second as it relates to Jonah chapter one. Let me challenge you to identify your Nineveh. Like what is that thing that God wants you to do that you don't wanna do? Where is it in your life that you're saying no to God? And I think it will benefit you greatly to figure out what that is so that you can also figure out how to stop running. That's the title of our series this month, Stop Running, and I hope you'll make it a priority for your next three weeks. God bless you. I love you guys. Stay safe.